Thank you uh, very much, Tom. Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to talk to you this evening um, about the Monks Investment Trust, which is managed by Bailey Gifford. Um, my name is John Henry. I'm a product specialist on the Monks Investment Trust, and I work closely with the investors who look after the underlying assets uh, of the fund. Now, in the next 20 minutes or so, um, there are two main areas that, that I would like to cover. Um, one is what makes us different, ultimately what sets us apart, and secondly, how we think about growth. And then I'll touch on some of the exciting areas that, in the portfolio that we think um, should generate attractive returns over the next five years or so. Ultimately, we're excited about the opportunities uh, within the trust and believe that it can be a valuable part of a retiree's portfolio in seeking to grow your capital and effectively offset the impact of inflation. Now, before we, forget, before we begin, what is uh, the Monks Investment Trust? Um, well, firstly, the name of the trust uh, does indeed reflect its ecclesiastical heritage. In 1931, Bailey Gifford was appointed to manage three trusts, the Friars, the Abbots, and the Monks Investment Trusts. Now, ultimately, in 1968, the trusts were then taken over and merged, and Monks acquired the outstanding share capital of the other two. And throughout that period, Bailey Gifford has managed the assets of those trusts. And today, the team that manages the trust is the Global Alpha Team, Bailey Gifford's largest uh, global equity strategy. And they have been managing the, the, the strategy uh, and the trust uh, since January 2015. The portfolio is managed um, by an established team of three, Charles Plowden, Malcolm McCall, and Spencer Adair, all of whom have been working together for the past 14 years in managing the strategy um, and they have over 24 years of experience on average uh, between them, and they are all partners of Bailey Gifford. Now, the portfolio itself is a collection of around 120 uh, of the world's best growth stocks. Our, our uh, main focus is to identify growth companies that we believe can deliver above average returns um, over the long run. Ultimately, that's what we believe uh, drives share prices. So we're focused on capital growth and we're low cost. On the latter point, the trust's ongoing charges figure is 52 basis points. And we're committed to reducing those costs where we can in time. So what makes us different? Well, I think really clarity in what we do and why we do it. Firstly, um, we are reward-seeking actual investors. Now by that, what we mean is that we believe we are um, effectively providers of risk capital to management teams uh, that we believe can grow their businesses over the long run. We do not attempt to second guess financial markets and instead we focus on identifying those growth businesses. Secondly, we, we embrace the asymmetries of returns in global equity markets. Now, This is a, an exciting aspect of global equity investing for us. So whilst your downside is capped at 100%, your upside is theoretically unlimited. So we structure our analysis and the portfolio to benefit from the equity returns that can be many times our initial investment. But more on that later. Thirdly, we are long-term stewards of capital. We build relationships with companies and we expect management teams to run their operations sustainably and we take our stewardship responsibilities seriously. And then finally, balance and diversification. The portfolio is balanced and diversified, as I said, across around 120 stocks. We value um, the ability to be able to plant many seeds and to harness ideas right across uh, the portfolio and from Bailey Gifford's stock picking um, capability. So our portfolio is ultimately ambitious and differentiated, but it is also diversified. Now, the next slide is intended to show uh, where we see the broad opportunities within the trust. Now, we tend not to look um, at the portfolio of you, the traditional um, benchmark classifications. We don't think that's representative of the underlying exposure in the fund. Instead, we prefer to use this method. So, to touch on it briefly, on the left-hand side, you can see that we have around about a fifth of the portfolio invested in what we call 
online platform businesses or scalable platforms. These are companies like Amazon and Alibaba, the, the Chinese internet giant. Next to that, you see we have another fifth of the portfolio or so in emerging middle classes. And here, in particular, we have a significant position in Asian savings through positions in Prudential, um, AIA, um, and Ping An, a domestic Chinese insurance business. On the right-hand side, you can see compounding machines at the bottom there. So about 16% in these types of companies. And these are companies that we think can consistently um, churn out steady levels of earnings growth and are largely underappreciated by the market. And finally, uh, you see growth cyclicals and improving outlook. That's for companies that are operating in cyclical sectors where there's a change in supply and demand dynamic at play and where we think there are opportunities. But really, without getting too bogged down in the details, the main message here is actually that the portfolio has many levers of growth and that we see no shortage of, of opportunity for the trust going forward. Now, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about why we pick stocks and why asymmetry matters. Now, some of you may have seen this uh, presentation or this information in other Bailey Gifford presentations. In any case, um, it's worth reiterating, given the centrality and importance of it to our investment philosophy. Now, the findings here are the work um, of Professor Hank Bessenbinder of Arizona State University, who conducted a review of stock market returns in the US. The, the chart summarizes his findings and shows that it's a minority of stocks that generates and adds a majority of the value in US stock markets. So what it shows is that 4% of stocks created all the wealth in excess of treasury bonds in the US in the 90 years to December 2016. So that is to say that just over 1,000 companies out of 26,000 generated returns over and above T-bills or cash in the US. But perhaps even more impressively is the 90 companies there that, uh, that delivered over half or around half of that excess return. So this supports our long-held view that we must seek to identify the very best, the few growth companies uh, and hold them for very long time, long, long time periods. So how is this reflected in the Monks Investment Trust? Well, this slide effectively shows asymmetry in action within the trust. It shows um, the 10 largest contributors or um, highest returning and 10 lowest returning stocks in the global alpha strategy since its inception back in 2005. You can see that Amazon is hugely impressive in having returned nearly 87 times our initial investment. But you can also see there are others too, like MasterCard, the digital payment business, up nearly nine times, um, and Schindler, the lift manufacturer, um, up nearly eight times. You can also see, as I said, the detractors or the poorer performers in red at the bottom. Now, what I hope this illustrates is that we only need a handful of long-term winners to more than outweigh the inevitable losers within the portfolio. This is what excites us, and this is why we are ambitious with our stock picking and in our search for the world's best growth opportunities. Now, I've mentioned the word long-term several times so far, um, and, and this slide here is uh, really a, a proof statement of our long-term approach. Now, as responsible long-term investors, we build relationships with companies, we get to know them, and we seek to back their growth ambitions. The left-hand side of the slide there shows that we hold stocks on average for about six years, which is four times uh, our global competitors. Ultimately, we believe that time is an essential component of success in equity markets. Companies need time to pursue a strategy and harness growth. But clearly holding companies for a long time is not all you need to do. Uh, the right-hand side there it shows that the, the, the companies in the portfolio invest more heavily for future growth. So they pay a lot more into the business rather than buying back shares or paying out dividends, which is what we want to see um, from, from the holdings in the trust. And indeed, they do so at a rate of two and a half times more than the broader benchmark, the companies existing in the broader benchmark. Moving on to, to how we think about growth in the trust, 
Um, so we're unashamedly ambitious in backing growth companies, but we also recognize that growth comes in many different shapes and sizes. <coughs> now, we seek to embrace that within the Monks Investment Trust. And this, sh this slide shows um, the four different growth profiles into which we categorize all the holdings within the trust. So what I thought I would do is touch on these briefly and then move on to give you some examples of, of the stocks falling into those different categories. Now, starting from left to right then, in that case, um, the, the stalwart companies, these are the, the steady growth companies, the companies that can compound their earnings um, consistently over time, often on the back of an established brand or, or market share. Rapid growth businesses, these are companies um, which are often growing their top line exponentially, growing their revenues exponentially, but investing heavily, often in, in, in technology and healthcare sectors. Cyclical growth businesses, um, these are, without stating the obvious, companies that operate in the cyclical sectors, but where we think the peak of the next cycle is likely to be higher than the last. Uh, and then finally, uh, in latent growth, uh, this is a bit more unusual in an Often companies have had a poor operational track record, particularly recently, and the broader investment market um, discounts them as growth businesses. Um, we think there's a catalyst for future change, and on that basis, uh, have included them in the portfolio. So that's a quick overview of the trust, uh, how we think about growth. Um, so let me touch on some of the examples uh, that I mentioned. The first I wanted to bring to your attention was, was Prudential, which is a really good example of a stalwart business in the portfolio. Its established UK and US operations uh, offer an annuity-like revenue stream with strong year-on-year -year pricing power. And indeed, the company has generated earnings per share growth of 12% per annum over the past 12 years. Exactly the sort of durable compounding of earnings growth that we're looking for in stalwart businesses. However, what we think the market is missing is the, the Asian insurance opportunity for Prudential. Currently, Prudential earns around about 65-70% of new business from Asia. Now, underlying fundament, fundamental structural growth drivers in the region mean this is a really attractive growth opportunity. Low levels of insurance penetration, rising levels of household income, income and low levels of welfare provision I mean, the adoption of insurance policies in Asia is likely to grow significantly over the next decade. We've twice added to Prudential this year, um, and we remain excited about the long-term opportunity here. And indeed, um, it forms a, a broader position within the trust um, and exposure to, to Asian insurance. Uh, as I mentioned, we also hold um, AIA and Ping An, the domestic Chinese insurance business. Uh, the next business I wanted to highlight is, is a Chinese company called Metuan Dianping, and it's a great example of a rapid growth company. This is an online platform business uh, which brings together buyers and sellers of services um, on its platform in China. And these types of companies, they often grow rapidly and scale quickly and offer the potential for very attractive returns and profitability in the long run. Now, Metuan is known as China's everything app. The business offers a wide range of services from transportation to travel uh, to shopping. However, we believe that it's its core online food offering, which is likely to drive future growth significantly. Now, Metuan's a market leader here with over 300 million users. Uh, and to give you an idea of scale there, you can see it delivers 27 or million orders a day. Um, that's about 300, million, 300 orders a second. Now, the Chinese market is vast. Um, it structurally underpenetrates the online service penetration of local services likely to rise significantly. But importantly, culturally, the Chinese market adopts technology more readily and more quickly. So, for example, apartments are being built in China now without kitchens, owing to the prevalence of online food ordering. And society in urban areas is becoming increasingly cashless. Uh, Metuan are investing heavily now to build scale for the future, and we're excited about their long-term profitability. Now, the next company uh, and pro pro um, profile that I wanted to highlight um, is Banco Bradesco. Um, and in particular, I wanted to highlight this because it shows the geographical diversity in the trust. Um, so we've talked about uh, a UK-listed insurance business uh, with Asian exposure. We've talked about a domestic Chinese online platform business. And this is um, a private bank in Brazil. 
Um, it is one of the leading private banks. It has diversified revenue stream, um, about a third, a third, a third between loans, insurance, and asset management. Um, first and foremost, uh, we think that this is a well-managed bank, um, which could be contrasted with many of the state-run banks in Brazil. So, for example, the board are incentivized in a very long-term manner um, with shares that vest on retirement, which means that their timelines are aligned with ours as investors uh, and the savers within the Monks Investment Trust. The banking market um, is consolidated with the top five banks accounting for somewhere in the region of 80% of the assets. And that's good for margins and good for profitability. Furthermore, Banco Bradesco are taking share as private sector players from the state incumbents. Longer term, we believe there's a growing opportunity here for Banco Bradesco to grow into loans and insurance further in the retail market in Brazil. Now, many in the market discount Banco Bradesco and others in Brazil upon concerns about political developments, as there have been many in recent times. But we remain focused on the company's fundamentals that I've outlined and believe that the attraction doesn't fully reflect the likelihood of growth for Banco Bradesco. And the final uh, company I wanted to highlight um, is in latent growth. Um, so as a reminder, latent growth companies are, which are those which don't appear to have had a particularly attractive or strong period of operational performance. But we believe that something is fundamentally changing. Uh, Eater Group, we think, it is one such example. Uh, following a merger back in 2013 of six companies, um, there is a management team in place who are ambitious. There are four main reasons we think this company can become uh, or have a brighter future than it has in the past. Firstly, um, it's the most efficient operator in the market. Turnover of land bank is very, is very quick uh, and much faster than its competitors. Increased scale uh, has brought about cost efficiencies. So we're gross margin at the moment for EDA is about 15%. We think that can rise to something more like 20%. Um, detached new builds are increasingly popular in Japan, um, and this is where largely um, EDA Group focuses. And then finally, um, expansion into Indonesia um, as a, as a longer-term growth opportunity for the company is very attractive. So I want to make clear, this is a small position within the trust, um, but should some of these fundamental factors I've outlined play out, and should there be a helpful level of economic reflation returning in the Japanese economy, we think this could drive attractive returns for either group and ultimately um, for, for the portfolio. Now, on my penultimate slide, what I thought I would do is touch on uh, performance, a key aspect of the trust, obviously. Um, and what we're trying to show here is that we must always focus on the long term. The chart on the right-hand side uh, shows the range of relative returns for the Monks Investment Trust. And that you can see that on a one-year view, um, we've delivered a, a range of relative returns um, between minus 5 and plus 10. What that really says is that over short time periods, such as a year, share prices can largely be a lottery. They can become completely disentangled and detached um, from the fundamental um, corporate performance of the holdings in the portfolio. We would encourage you to take, a, uh, to take more of a, a focus on the longer term performance over five years or more, the investment time horizons that we have. And you can see that the range of relative returns is narrowed in positive territory. Um, and overall, um, the underlying global alpha strategy for the last five years has delivered um, excess returns, net of fees of 2.5% above the benchmark. So to, to finalize, um, the Monks Investment Trust, in our view, is a clearly differentiated proposition. Most global funds um, are indistinguishable, um, as you can see on the chart there on the slide. Um, it is the Bailey Gifford funds which really stand out on the right-hand side. So the Monks uh, is a core global growth offering um, that I've just talked about there and resides alongside its sister trust, the Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, and the Edinburgh Worldwide Investment Trust. The Monks Trust offers a diversified yet ambitious investment strategy and seeks to encompass an attractive breadth of growth and is well placed to grow capital for the long lived retiree with a time horizon of five years or more. And all of this comes, as I said, competitively priced as we seek to deliver the best outcome for investors and savers in the trust. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.